mit einem Nahbild bist. Na, so nah ist nicht. <lacht> Greetings. I'm happy to begin our debate on our expander. Was it all ovarian function suppression? If this was a compelling question last week in clinic, it has become red hot since the presentations yesterday, looking at the update of the SOFTS trial, which demonstrated a sustained benefit for ovarian suppression with AI treatment, and of course, the update from the SWA group on the R Bonder trial itself. So this is something we've been eagerly looking forward to, and I think it is fair to say it's the most interesting question right now in early stage breast cancer for ER positive tumors. I'm Hal Burstein from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, and it's my honor to be the moderator and chair for this program. We're going to be hearing uh, two diverging opinions on this. On the pro side, Michael Ganant, professor at the Medical University of Vienna and a leader of the uh, Australian Breast Cancer Study Group, a group that's been very interested in endocrine therapy over the years. And on the con side, Sibel Leubel, uh, for, chair of the German Breast Group, a group that has done huge trials in chemotherapy-based and targeted-based therapy for early-stage breast cancer. Now, before we get going, I invite you all to take out your smartphones. We're going to show a QR code here for the Sligo, uh, 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 the Slido set. Oh, oh, where did that go? It didn't appear. Where'd it go? Oh, I apologize. Um, if you're online, go to Slido. Uh, we will be doing some polling momentarily, and um, there is the opportunity, of course, to ask questions. And we've asked our speakers to keep their remarks sufficiently short that we have plenty of time for a Q&A. And finally, I, I, given the circumstances, I, I do want to comment that um, we are sort of a pod up here. Um, uh, I know there have been questions about this uh, in social media during the conference, but uh, all three of us have been vaccinated and boosted and had negative testing immediately before our travel. So uh, we, we encourage everyone to take appropriate precautions. So uh, let's start with last week's New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the publication of the 21 gene assay to inform chemotherapy benefit in node positive breast cancer. And we had an update on this yesterday from Kevin Kalinsky. As you know, this trial showed that for women who were postmenopausal with one to three positive nodes and ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer, that adding chemotherapy to endocrine therapy was of no clinical benefit. However, in premenopausal women with the same uh, tumor biomarkers and a score of 25 or less, there did look to be a clinically important benefit for the addition of chemotherapy with an improvement in invasive disease-free survival and distant relapse-free survival. So there have now been three major trials of gene expression profiling driven adjuvant therapy for women with ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. The first was the Taylor X study from uh, ECOG Akron led by Joe Sperano. And they've published now several updates of clinical outcomes among patients who had no negative breast cancer and a recurrent score of 11 to 25. As you can see in the aggregate, there was absolutely no benefit for the addition of chemotherapy with respect to disease-free or metastatic-free survival. However, in subset analysis of this trial, women who were premenopausal appeared to gain benefit with both distant recurrence-free and overall recurrence-free survival, in contrast to women who were postmenopausal where there was no signal of benefit in any of the cohorts. And interestingly, that benefit was more pronounced with the elevation of the RS score as you went from uh, less than 15, uh, 16 to 20, or 21 to 25. Our expander, which we've alluded to a couple times, was a very similarly designed trial. Zero to 25 was the recurrence score range. Uh, here are the endpoints from the recent New England Journal of Medicine publication. Overall, there was a 1% uh, difference, clinically not important, uh, for disease-free survival uh, amongst all patients. And on your right, there was no benefit in the postmenopausal cohort. But again, intriguingly, there was a suggestion here in the far right that for women who were premenopausal with diagnosis, there was a several percentage point absolute difference in terms of distant relapse survival for the addition of chemotherapy to endocrine therapy. Finally is the MINDAC trial. And this was a study that stratified patients both on clinical risk and on genomic risk. Here are the major observations for the clinical higher risk tumors, but with a genomic low risk signature, in this case using the um, uh, Mammoprint 70 gene uh, signature, which dichotomized patients to high or low. 
And as you can see in this trial, overall, there was no significant benefit for the addition of chemotherapy to women who had tumors that were clinical high risk but genomic low risk. However, in an update uh, presented last year at this meeting and published recently by the investigators, uh, if you look at postmenopausal women, uh, that same no benefit for chemotherapy observation persists. But in women less than age 50, there was an intriguing difference, again, favoring chemoendocrine therapy over chemotherapy. Now, each of these trials included a substantial number of premenopausal women. Right around one third of the cohorts were premenopausal. And as we heard yesterday, uh, some of these women who got endocrine therapy alone did receive ovarian suppression, though in fact the number of patients who received ovarian suppression was in fact consistently very small, uh, between about 13 and 15 percent in these major trials. Now, before moving to our combatants discussants here today, I just want to remind you of a couple of other things. One is that we know that chemotherapy is a very powerful inducer of uh, amenorrhea and early onset menopause. This is a classic slide from Pam Goodwin, now over 20 years ago, pointing out that in an age-dependent fashion, women who receive adjuvant chemotherapy are far more likely to have premature onset of menopause or amenorrhea during their first year after treatment um, uh, compared to women who receive endocrine therapy alone or women who receive no adjuvant treatment. So that begs the question, how important is chemotherapy as a cytotoxic drug killing off cancer cells itself as opposed to chemotherapy as an elaborate way to achieve ovarian suppression. And with that, we're going to have our debate on genomic profile-driven chemoendocrine therapy in premenopausal women. Is it all ovarian function suppression? On the pro side, Michael Ganant, take the podium. Good morning. I'm going to discuss the data with you. So remember, this is not about whether there is any benefit. The question is, as Hal has just stated, whether this is a cytotoxic effect or it is the side effect of ovarian function suppression for most, if not all, of the effects we see in our sponsor. So here are my disclosures. As you know, I'm from Vienna not only home of the Austrian breast and colorectal cancer study group, we don't have kangaroos over there, yeah. but also the city of music and art, and so we have as many museums as San Antonio has steak, steak houses uh, along the riverwalk. And actually, that's, that's how I feel in this particular moment. So that's Peter Paul Rubens, Daniel in the Lions Den, a small painting in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna of about 25 by 18 inches. Because after all, claiming that the endocrine side effect is what the chemotherapy benefit um, uh, makes is an uphill battle. After all, this is a country where until a couple of years ago, everybody received adjuvant chemotherapy just based on age alone irrespective of risk. So, very small painting in Vienna, dated to the year 1614. And during my years at the NCI, I detected that actually there is a large ver version of this painting by Peter Paul Rubens in the West Wing of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And this one is 11 feet by 8 feet, so everything is bigger in the U.S., obviously. What helps me and gives me confidence is actually the facts and that there is a shift in opinion. So even the usually conservative St. Gallen consensus panel earlier this year, and by the way, I would hope that many of you can attend the next uh, uh, St. Gallen meeting in March 23 in Vienna. Even there, 80% of that global group of experts in total answer to the question, do you believe that the chemotherapy-induced ovarian suppression makes the effectiveness of chemo in premenopausal patients? At least half, at least 75%, or actually all of it. Now, let's review the data. What is the optimal treatment? Is it cytotoxic chemotherapy because of its cytotoxic effects? Is it tamoxifen or any of the other or everything? And I think we need to realize 
that we are still in danger of heavily over-treating these patients if we give them treatment that, treatments that basically do the same. Let's look at the figures. Hal has already showed the um, recurrence score 11 to 25 in the immediate risk group of Taylor X. Obviously, no difference, no benefit for chemotherapy. And when you split this down in young patients below the age of 50, then you see that actually with the recurrence score of 16 to 20, the difference is 0.8% in distant free survival. And between 21 and 25, it's 3.2%. So just to define the magnitude overall of the benefit. Same is true for our expander. So that's last year's slide, 2.9% um, difference at five years in distant recurrences. And in Kevin Kalinsky's elegant update earlier this year of this very important, uh, earlier, actually yesterday, <laughs> earlier at this meeting, 2.8% um, for the recurrence score 14 to 25 group. When you look at MindEct, again, at five years, in young patients only, 2.6% difference at five years. So we can summarize our first statement. Modern adjuvant chemotherapy trials indicate a two to three distant disease free survival benefit at five years for premenopausal patients. Now let's review the figures for ovarian function suppression. This is actually the Oxford overview of ovarian ablation in the absence of chemotherapy. And when you look here, the difference here, the delta is 13.2% at five years. And that remains consistent after the end of treatment, uh, even at 10 years and 15 years, you see there is the same benefit of, of ovarian ablation, ablation versus no ovarian ablation. And in fact, we keep saying that we don't have these trials. Well, we do have these trials. We just forgot somehow about them. There is quite a number of trials comparing ovarian suppression versus chemotherapy. Not all of them with, from today's perspective, the optimal designs or treatments, but some of them provide excellent insights in the subject at hand. This is actually a German trial. So Sibyl's president has developed this excellent trial of ovarian function suppression with LHRH analog goserilene versus CMF. And as you can see, no difference whatsoever, which is clear because both interventions do the same. They suppress ovarian function. And when you look, and that's actually important data, which I believe we should have from more trials about the actual frequency and prevalence of treatment-induced amenorrhea, very obviously when you do two years of uh, GHRH analog, then you will have almost 100%. With chemo, this is a, in an age-dependent manner obviously less pronounced. And there is an excellent review by Janice Walsh and Sandra Swain in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, where they look at over 50 chemotherapy trials and just look at whether the amenorrhea, if the data is there, and the survival is correlated. And this is the case in virtually all these trials. In short, if you give adjuvant chemotherapy and you induce amenorrhea, then there is going to be a survival difference. If you give adjuvant chemotherapy and there is no amenorrhea, there won't be an outcome difference. Quite convincing, isn't it? So, second part of the summary, ovarian suppression and or chemotherapy induced amenorrhea provide outcome benefits of 9 to 13% at five years. Let's review a number of other trials. So that's an old Austrian trial. And it's, a, it's very similar to the German Zebra trial, but it was a little bit smarter back then. It was not Sibyl, but it were, were her predecessors. It was ovarian function suppression plus tamoxifen compared to CMF. And actually what you can see, and this is overall survival, is a significant difference published in the JCO in 2006. And one can claim that, well, yes, that's the tamoxifen, because unfortunately, from today's point of view, the CMF didn't have the tamoxifen in that arm. But that's approximately the size there. So another confirmation that chemotherapy has, yields the same effect as ovarian function suppression. 
And in fact, you can say, okay, that's CMF. We are not using this any longer. Let's look at an IBC G trial in 1193. Very simple design. Ovarian function suppression plus tamoxifen, optimal endocrine treatment at the time, versus the same optimal endocrine treatment plus anthracycline-containing adjuvant chemotherapy. And we have 10 years follow-up here for disease for survival and for over survival, and you can see no difference whatsoever. So in the presence of optimal endocrine adjuvant treatment, adjuvant chemotherapy doesn't add anything because you already have achieved the effect of treatment-induced amenorrhea. And speaking of risk, why should it be different in young patients? I mean, this is NSVB 20. And you look at the recurrence scores, up to 30, nothing there for chemotherapy. So all the chemotherapy benefit is driven by the highest risk patient subgroup. You look at the real world data about outcomes of treating these patients without chemotherapy, below 50 years here, that's the Clalit registry. And you see the only relapses up to seven years occur in the high risk group. And actually the green is even the low, the intermediate which we are discussing after our responder doesn't yield a single distant disease recurrence. Now, it's all the same, whether you use chemotherapy or you use, in some environments, ovarectomy or chemical ovarian function suppression for a while, you are suppressing ovarian function. And I think a very important final argument is age. And we used to believe that young age particularly triggers the need for adjuvant chemotherapy because it would be so wonderfully effective. In fact, the opposite is true when you look at the amenorrhea rates, because obviously, and Dr. Bernstein showed um, Pam Goodwin's slide, at very young age, the prevalence of treatment-induced amenorrhea is, is much less than, than, let's say, at age 40 or 45. And this is actually a slide by the late Aaron Goldhirsch, and I'm grateful to Meredith Reagan for providing it to me. When you look at all these chemotherapy trials, long-term follow-up, and you depict the difference in terms of below the age of 35 or above the age of 35, and by the way, also with hormone receptors, when you look at endocrine-responsive disease below the age of 35, the acid ratios are particularly poor. Now you can say, okay, that's a publication that is 20-year-old, but let's look at today's data, Taylor X. Intermediate risk group, 16 to 25. Age 46 to 50, premenopausal, yes. Here is the chemotherapy benefit. Why? Because it's easy for chemo to induce amenorrhea in that age group. Hazard ratio not as good in 41 to 45, and below the age of 40, the addition of chemotherapy in Taylor X doesn't produce anything. And why is that? Because that's only about a third of, of patients having ovarian function suppression in addition, as we heard, and the chemotherapy is just not good enough in suppressing ovarian function in that very young age group. And look what can be achieved in avoiding chemotherapy in this particular group we are discussing. This is the wonderful West German study group. You know, I'm, I keep quoting German studies, I have to say. The ADAPT trial, very pragmatic approach. So what they did, and I think this is hugely smart and we should actually use it more. They give three weeks plus minus of an endocrine treatment, tamoxifen or letrozole in the postmenopause, and then they look at whether the KIA67 came down at the time of surgery or at the time of rebiopsy. And as a matter of fact, when you do this and you define endocrine responders, again, this is patients 50 years or younger, five-year distant disease for survival, no chemotherapy, 97%. And this is better than the outcome of patients with chemotherapy in endocrine non-responders. Obviously, there is no difference in the postmenopause, but that has been established. And you look at Meredith Reagan's elegant update of soft text from yesterday, and you see 
And this includes node uh, positive patients. The distant recurrence at 12 years, 2%, 3% overall survival, 95, 97%. What do you ask of chemotherapy to even improve on that? So, summary three. Ovarian suppression-based endocrine therapy yields excellent outcomes for most premenopausal patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer. For our debate, the answer is yes. What does it mean for clinical practice next Monday? For the large group of lower risk premenopausal patients, tamoxifen alone will be good enough. For those with moderate or intermediate risk patients, ovarian function suppression plus either tamoxifen or an AI with big attention to the side effects in making the choice. And I would close in stating that chemotherapy is just a graceless method of ovarian function suppression and should only be given to high-risk patients and to patients with endocrine non-responsive disease. Thank you very much.